Welcome back. The Atlantic hurricane season officially starts on June 1st, but early predictions already out are that it could be a busy one. Channel 3's chief meteorologist Mark Dixon is here to talk about that. Plus, Canadian wildfires, a new National Weather Service tool to keep us safe when it's hot. Thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's start with hurricanes. Sure. Uh, everybody who predicts this stuff, <laughs> and I know not all the predictions are out, but those that are, are saying it's going to be a busy year uh, over in the weather department. Yeah, uh, so NOAA, uh, National Hurricane Center, they come out with their outlook in May. But as you mentioned, there are several different organizations that have already come out and uh, overly active, extremely active. Uh, and we've broken it down for you here. So CSU, that's Colorado State University. Uh, they've been doing this for decades, uh, AccuWeather, and as well as the Weather Channel. Uh, so 23 uh, tropical, those are named storms, and basically in that realm across the board of those, um, becoming hurricanes 11 8 to 12 11 so the theme here is is constant that it's overly active and then of those hurricanes when we speak of major hurricanes that's category three or stronger and you know looking at those numbers as you said they're all sort of in the same ballpark and i know enough uh as i i watch meteorology from the from the news desk but you know we look at models and as the models start to come into agreement you get more confidence in a forecast when you see multiple prediction services all saying the same thing. Does that kind of get your attention as well? Yeah, it, it is alarming. And it's been like last year we had 20 named storms. It was our fourth most active or, or season with, with the fourth uh, highest named storms uh, in, in the historically speaking. So um, and, and looking at the averages real quick, just to give a point of comparison, uh, 14 is what we typically see uh, on average uh, hurricanes of those uh, seven and of those seven, three becoming uh, major hurricanes. So yes, the modeling, of course, is something that we look at as storms are in the process of developing and how they're going to move and how they're going to intensify. But uh, looking kind of larger scale, uh, the, the sea surface temperatures have been running historically high at record levels as of late. And not only at sea surface level, but also the warmth is going deeper into the ocean. So that's adding the fuel for these storms uh, as they develop. And that's always something you look at as you look at those tracks when they're far, far, far away from Connecticut, you're thinking, is it warm water, right? Is that one of the things that really can affect oh, absolutely. what's gonna happen? I mean, it is really the fuel uh, for these storms. Okay. Something else, of course, you hear, El Nino, La Nina. So we've had an El Nino cycle. Uh, so this is warming of the equatorial Pacific, and that affects what happens in the Atlantic as it um, creates wind shear. And that really tears these storms apart as they try to develop. So it can suppress the development. The El Nino, it is breaking down. Uh, it is weakening. That will be replaced with a building La Nina, which is conversely the cooling of the equatorial Pacific. And this is forecast to develop as we head into the peak of the season. So we're talking about August into September. And with the lack of wind shear, that's going to allow the storms to further develop, really enhance that. Because the wind shear could break those storms apart. But if they can stay together, then they have the warm ocean water yes. as an added uh, fuel boost that could be something alarming. Yeah, there, there are lots of factors, but the two main ones, the sea surface temperatures and uh, the building La Nina as we head into the peak. Now, I know we have a graphic with the names because we're going to be getting ready. If, <laughs> if these people are right, we're going to blow right through this list. Yes, so uh, this is the list that comes out. There are six lists that the National Hurricane Center uses uh, and actually in tandem with the World Meteorological Organization, starting at the top of the alphabet, alternating gender. Uh, so we've got 21 names here, uh, and we've only gone past 21 names twice. Uh, uh, most recently, uh, that was in 2020. That was our most active season when we had 30 named storms. But prior to that, 2005 is when we had to pivot to the Greek alphabet. We had 28 named storms. So uh, given we went to the Greek alphabet in 2005, uh, more recently, we now have supplemental lists. So if we make it past 21 again, uh, we'll go to that supplemental list. And I want to move on to other topics. But as people watch this and say, oh, my gosh, Mark, you know, 20 something named storms. This is going to be crazy. The one thing we can't say is how it's going to affect us, because last year there were a lot of named storms, but the U.S. dodged a lot of bullets. So there's a lot of skill in forecasting maybe how many storms could develop. What we can't really do is forecast where they develop and exactly where they're going to move and where landfall will take place. And, you know, keep in mind here in Connecticut, we don't have to have a landfalling storm along our coastline to have an impact. I'm going to look back at Irene, look at Sandy, huge impacts here across southern New England. All right, let's talk about some other stuff. Sure. The National Weather Service has put out a new type of advisory uh, that would uh, tell people if it's dangerously hot. Tell us about that. <laughs> so we have historically um, issued the Weather Service um, 
uh, heat advisories, high uh, extreme heat warning type situation uh, alerts. But now there's a, a collaborative effort with the CDC. So this is a, a ranking system from one to four, minor, moderate, major, and extreme with the impact of the heat on you and how you live your life. And, and it takes into account several factors. You know, how unusual is the heat for that time of year? And then also taking into account the temperature not only daytime highs, but how the low how low the temperatures go at night. And sometimes they don't really drop that much. We could have temps some locations in the upper 70s, even low 80s. So that will play into uh, this system that is still experimental. So uh, the, the Weather Service now just recently launching this. Uh, so again, in collaboration with the CDC, as far as if the heat will pose a risk, an elevated risk to those who maybe have issues related to, uh, to heat. We only have about two minutes left, and I do want to get to wildfires, but I just want you to tell viewers so how will they see your forecast incorporate that when when will that come into play i, I guess when necessary uh whenever we uh, of course have first alerts first alert weather days if it's going to be a high impact event where uh the weather will influence how our viewers our residents um you know live their lives and how they carry on from day to day we will make sure to, to convey that May, maybe not showing everyone like a you know on a quiet day like it's a zero but uh yeah as we get into those elevated uh, situations yeah we'll convey that we'll see those colors in that new chart tell me about the wildfires and i was saying this to you before we began I don't ever remember as a kid growing up in Connecticut having that wildfire smoke make it hazy. The last few years, and we had, here's some pictures of Hartford Incredible. with that, that smoke creating the haze. This is still an issue in Canada, and it's been an ongoing one for, for years. Tell us what's going on. Yeah, so parts of Canada uh, actually in their third year of extreme drought. And then on top of that, uh, we have very warm temperature. So uh, we're coming off the most destructive wildfire season where nearly 50 million acres were burned. And while things are better now, even through the winter, uh, the, the, the wildfires did not entirely go away. There were reports of kind of they're smoldering. Uh, they call them zombie fires, kind of they've gone underground. So even in a winter storm, folks in Canada were able to smell smoke, which was kind of eerie. So uh, this past winter was warmer than normal, uh, still widespread drought in this upcoming uh, spring and even into the summer looking unseasonably warm and continued dry. So uh, with regard to any fires that do flare up, it's all about the wind flow aloft and at the surface as far as getting that smoke from Canada down here across New England and, and even farther south. So certainly something else you'll be watching. Sounds like <laughs> yes. it's going to be a busy summer. Cancel your vacation. <laughs> yeah, no, just stay here, stay informed. <laughs> we'll give you the first alert. You know, no, got... not their vacations, your oh, vacations. Oh, my vacations. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they can take their vacations. Uh, yeah. You just have to cancel yours. You're going to be busy. And we've got lots of modeling to help as well show how the wind flow is moving that smoke around. And listen, we're only about 10 days away from my favorite day of the year, the day we pass 70 as the yep. average high. Yep, yep, Was that yep. May 9th? Yeah, it's something right around, around there. there. Yeah. So I watch that candle. That's my favorite day. Excellent. Mark Dixon, Chief Meteorologist, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. That is CT24 for this week. CBS Sunday Morning, of course, is coming up next. Have a great rest of your weekend. We'll meet you back here in Studio A next Sunday morning.